uh, welcome to this live Q&A. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Your lecture, as I said, last was fantastic last week, Some, you know, and it's had a really fantastic reception. It's been viewed several thousand times uh, over, the past, over the past week, and I've been looking and gathering questions um, over the past week as well. So I know that it's, it's gathered a lot, of, a lot of interest. Perhaps for those people who didn't see the lecture live last week, could you just give us a two to three minute summary of some of the main issues that you were talking about during that lecture? Okay, so um, the lecture was an overview really of some of the ways of looking at volcanic hazards that um, we kind of teach on our second and third year courses. So we do a second year course general hazards and a third year course very specifically about volcanoes and although the whole thing is about like the many many aspects of volcanoes hazards is something that's that's kind of taught it a level it's something that that i know our undergraduates are very interested in so the theme of the volcano was was insight on volcanic hazards but to do that of course you've got to start with with setting the scene so i, I sort of spent the first bit of the lecture talking about um volcanoes of the world so how volcanoes get where they are where they're mainly distributed um and what that means about the style of hazard so if you think about kind of a map of the world the majority of volcanoes are around um continental plate boundaries sort of in particularly in destructive plate boundaries where you've got subduction zones so one plate subducting under another that has major impacts on the earth's crust and that promotes the uh, release of heated magma and therefore volcanism. <clears throat> you also get volcanoes occurring on divergent plate boundaries where you've got sort of two, two, two tectonic plates moving apart. That releases pressure, that allows partial melting, and that again releases magma. And so both of those tectonic settings are where you get most of the world's volcanoes. So we kind of talked about that. On top of that, there are there are other volcanoes. So there's a there's a thing called hot spot volcanism, which is easiest to explain, I suppose, with um, a, a big pan full of golden syrup, which is the, the classic way of teaching geology through food. Um, apparently they do this at geology undergraduate. I'm, I'm reliably informed. So if you heat a plate uniformly, um, convection currents will start to rise in particular places. You can see it's obviously if you heat, if you heat some, some golden syrup and then have a look, you'll see convection currents rising. Um, and, and the model, the model of hotspot volcanism, is that although the Earth's mantle, in particular the upper part, the asthenosphere, even though that is, is rock and it's technically a solid, um, it behaves, geologically speaking, like a liquid because of the pressures and temperatures. And particularly, you get these convection cells in the upper part of the mantle, mantle that bring convection currents, a bit like a, like a lava lamp, um, to the surface. And that forms a thing called hot spot volcanism. So you get this all over the world, sometimes at plate boundaries, but sometimes not. And so he talks about how volcanoes get there. <clears throat> and that then leads on to the fact that these different tectonic settings mean that the, the molten magma rises through the crust in different ways. And so that can affect the chemistry of the magma, can, and which predominantly drives, in, for what we're interested in today, predominantly drives among other things, viscosity. And the more viscous the magma, the higher the pressure when you get an eruption, so it's more explosive. And that then feeds into this idea that you get different hazards. You know, So in um, more fluid lavas, you get more lavas. In more um, viscous lavas, you get more explosive eruptions. And generally speaking, the more explosive the eruption, the more hazard hazardous it is. And so we talked about key hazards. So tephra, so volcanic ash, this stuff travels from many thousands of kilometers in some cases from the volcano. Pyroclastic flows, these kind of flows of high energy pyroclastic particles running at very high speed down the volcano, often the product of a collapse of a, or a partial collapse of an eruptive column. They are amongst the most dangerous hazards close to the volcano. Um, lahars, so kind of mudslides, often occurring when you may melt ice masses that are on a volcano. Many, many <clears throat> thousands of deaths have been attributed to, to lahars. And then we talked about things like gases and, and, and transport of material away from the volcano that can also be a hazard. So, for example, volcanoes are known to induce, um, or very big eruptions are known to induce global scale cooling for a short period of time, like one to four years. 
but some people argue that um, that there's been enough cooling attributable to volcanic eruptions to actually have caused famines, for example. And although we didn't go into a lot of detail about that because it it starts it's quite a big debate and um, takes a while to discuss. Volcanoes and climate is another important aspect of how volcanoes interact with different aspects of, of human society and the world. So uh, volcanoes and atmospheres were were kind of where I finished off. So I think that's that's a broad summary. And then we just looked at some key case studies of these different types of hazards um, and where they, um, you know, so we, how we might manage them. So a really good example of that would be the area near uh, Vesuvius in Italy. So north of Vesuvius, you've got um, Naples. South, you've got places like Salerno. So you've got lots of urban centers near a volcano that doesn't erupt very often. But when it does erupt, has the potential to be highly explosive and therefore very dangerous. And managing that is a is a very tricky thing. And actually, you talked about interestingly enough, Al, you were talking about resources for mm. um, for teachers and for for classes. So we're trying to design a resource at the moment where we're going to use Naples as the example. And we're layering in different base maps on GIS, and either these can be accessed online by students in a classroom or in a computer room, or you can download the resource and just you sort of upload the maps for the teacher to talk about the maps themselves. And then the idea is to map the risk against where people are living. So Fantastic. one of the things that makes volcanoes very dangerous isn't the volcano. I mean, it's dangerous. The volcano is inherently dangerous. It's the fact that people live there. And that's, you know, historical. So, you know, you go back in time when, when population densities were much lower, many volcanoes are in really, really good settings that you might want to live in. You know, the soils, alophane soils are known to be... Um, to be highly productive, so great for farming. Many a volcano is near the coast, so you've got seafood, fish resources. You know, there are good places to be, or near nearby anyway. Um, and so cities and towns build up. If these volcanoes don't erupt that often, you know, the last really big eruption of, of Vesuvius, for example, was back back about 500 years ago. But there was one in 1944, but it wasn't massive. And so the big eruptions, if they're quite far apart, you know, cultural memory, you know that you know. Cultural memory fades and, and, and the danger isn't perceived. Modern yeah. science is now pinpointing an awful lot of very dangerous volcanoes that are very close to reasonably large populations. So that's that's another thing we kind of touched on, this, this human aspect of it. Amazing. Simon, uh, that, that sounds like an absolutely incredible tour that you took people on last week of, uh, of the issue of, of volcanoes and volcanic hazards. It's really exciting. And I've got loads of questions oh, good. That, I, that I want to ask you and also questions that I've been able to harvest over the, the past week from people who've emailed in um, and who have written uh, on comments on your, on your video. Can I just ask a personal question, first of all? How did yep. you first get into volcanoes yourself? What was it that drove your interest initially? Um. I think like everyone, um, well, not like everyone, like many, many, many people I know, um, I've liked and been interested in volcanoes since I was a boy because they're just, you know, fundamentally this amazingly unusual thing, you know. So my first um, interaction with volcanoes was going on holiday as a teenager and, and walking up Mount Vesuvius and visiting Pompeii. And, I, you know, I've always had an interest in history uh, and prehistory. Um, and so seeing Pompeii, and destructive power of the volcano kind of in the flesh was interesting and amazing and then walking up that volcano was also interesting and amazing uh, so it's always been there i suppose but i particularly got into understanding or trying to understand volcanoes um through my background research so i'm not a volcanologist you know my primary research isn't about solely about volcanoes i work on um so i'm a, a physical geographer i'm a I'm a, what they call a quaternary scientist. So I study the, the climate and e environment of the last kind of million or so years. Um, and I mentioned human behavior, climate change, uh, and volcanoes is a part of that right. in terms of forcing. So, you know, there are big volcanic eruptions that are argued to have played a role in our own evolution. So kind of that side of volcanoes from my own training in, in my, own, my, my PhD. Um, but also... I go into volcanoes because one of the ways we um, do the kind of research I do, which is kind of date climate change and date archaeology, is we use volcanic ash layers. So I trace volcanic ash layers around the world in all sorts of different sites and use them to ask questions, various questions about science, kind of, you know, what is the expression of, of environmental change here for a particular given climate forcing compared to somewhere else? How has that affected this human population? And that re requires dating things. 
And, and if you've got a marker there that you know it's the same age anywhere you go for thousands of kilometers, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And that's that's kind of a, been a staple of tool of my research for, for years. And if you get into tephra, volcanic ash layers, you have to understand how it gets there and you have to understand all the processes that can change it. And you get more and more interested in the volcanoes themselves. And so I just, over years of, of research, just became completely, totally into volcanoes. So I'm building on this childhood interest, really. Amazing. I mean, it sounds like a long-standing interest. And, and for you, it's a very kind of practical interest that it, yeah. it, it gives you access to a, a knowledge bank that allows you to use these dating techniques, which... So yeah. do, do you want to just tell us a little bit more about how you can how you use Tephra in order to to conduct the research that, that you do? Because I think I think that that for many people will be a bit of a mystery at the moment. And, and it's what actually will also bridge the gap, I think, between school and university kind of geography, the kind of stuff yeah, that people okay. might do when they get here. Yeah, I mean, that's that, absolutely. I mean, um, so Tephra, very, very simply, um, the fine ash phase of Tephra, so the, the stuff that's kind of two mil and smaller. This is the kind of material that comes explosively out of the top of the volcano, gets, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 kilometers into the atmosphere, and is transported by winds, stratospheric winds, hundreds to thousands of kilometers away from the volcano. Think about, I mean, even small eruptions like the Aeopolyok eruption um, that closed all the aircraft. That, that was distributed across the North Atlantic and right across Europe. And that wasn't a very big eruption. So this stuff gets transported the wrong way. We can find this in lake sediments. We can find it in marine cores. So these are classic climate archives. We can find it in ice cores. These are really important climate archives. Um, and we can also find it in archaeological sites. And that means we have, uh, and then once we find it, we can use the chemistry of the ash to source it back to a volcano. So we know what, which, what we're dealing with. We've got a fingerprint. And that means we have lots of layers that we can do this with. We can then just line up the, the strata of all of our layers and work out when things are happening in relation to the ash. So a, a simple example would be um, if you've got a very abrupt climate change, as we're having now, but it also happens in the past. If you have very abrupt climate change and you can get you can get shifts in climate, very big ones that happen within a decade or so, you will never ever have a dating method that's good enough to resolve that in all of your records. So what you can't test is how something that important and rapid propagates around a region. Okay. With the tephra layers, you can. So that's what we do. And then we can ask other questions like, does that impact on human populations? So that's very kind of high level science, but it all starts with volcano and this is the good bit. So I get to do all that stuff, which I'm interested in, but tracing it back to the volcano means you have to work with volcanologists. So what we often do We'll go out in the field with volcanologists. We'll be sampling these tephra layers in the field to get a good understanding of the chemistry. We'll also be talking to the volcanologists and working with them about the frequency of the eruptions, what drives the volcano. So you get to, you know, it's kind of boys' own fun stuff. You get to do these amazing field trips and field work out in places like Iceland. And I mean, you know, we do quite a lot of work in Iceland or Ar Armenia, understanding new volcanic centers, and then then tracing it into kind of questions about climate science about human evolution, you know, about um, Bronze Age archaeology is my latest thing at the moment. Amazing. So you, so you can use these, these ash layers that are deposited all, all around the world, presumably on the land surface, but also these things fall into lakes and form part of yeah. what lake sediments and other things. Yeah. And that allows you to make a judgment about when a particular layer was laid down. Yeah. And that, that allows you to determine the time scale ar around which, for example, you can make uh, induce or uh, conclusions about the climate at that particular time yeah so I, I mean a really simple example at the moment we are working on this lake in norfolk of all places um which is called dismere it's really pretty really really little pretty lake in the middle of a town in norfolk very very unassuming but that lake is quite special it, it lays down a winter and a summer layer that's preserved so it's called var it's annually laminated so we have an annually resolved signal of climate change now, in that lake, we also have tephra layers from Icelandic volcanic eruptions that are very, because of this layering, are very precisely dated. And the lake has a climate signal. So we can start saying, OK, now we can see climate and how it's affecting climate at very precise resolution in England. We can trace those tephras to other records and say, how is that climate signal working in, say, Europe? 
And that becomes important because what we're really interested in in climate science is not just the averages of climate change. Yeah. We're interested in how that affects different regions. You know, if you think about global warming going forward for the next 100 years, every 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 scientist I know would accept that, that we're going to get warmer. The question now is, what does that mean for different parts of Europe, say? Because sure. not because climate change is never distributed evenly. You know, the Arctic is warming much more than the than the Pacific. So that's so, amazing. Oh, no, so you've provided us with a new insight into into volcanoes that I didn't necessarily expect because we were largely talking about hazards yeah. before. But but this but this is yes an, another thing that volcanoes can tell us. Yes. Yeah, they're amazing. They, they're, they're the gift that keeps giving. I mean, and if we're talking about climate change, well, volcanoes themselves also cause climate change. So one of the really interesting questions is is how you know, we, we know a large eruption. So say Pinatubo back in the 90s, a large eruption will that's tropical. So it, it gets up into the atmosphere and spreads globally will cause global cooling for, say, one to four years. That's reasonably well understood. What's more interesting is what happens if you get a few of those together and that also coincides, say, with a period of low solar activity. Um, okay. How does that work? So there's the, the, you may have heard of the Little Ice Age. Yes, uh, yeah. f famously people ice skating on the River Thames. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. there's a, quite a big debate in the literature about, about the, the causes of the Little Ice Age. Is it volcanoes or is it solar activity? So we know there are two periods of reduced solar activity that are, well, you know, that are within the Little Ice Age and generally thought to have played a driving role. But, but there's periods in the Little Ice Age, especially in the early part, where you really aren't in a solar minima. But there are closely spaced volcanic eruptions. So the interplay of volcanoes and solar activity is both really important in the past for understanding past climate change. But actually, these things will happen in the future. And, and understanding how that interacts with human-induced global warming is quite important. And when we think about the Little Ice Age, I mean, we think about, you know, these frost fairs and things, you know, as I say, on the River Thames and the opportunity to go ice skating. But presumably, you know, it wasn't all fun and games for people at that moment either. You know, I mean, it, it sounds as though that could have also have induced changes in climate that could have caused crops to fail or could have caused you know famine to have emerged. So, you know, when we talk about volcanic hazards, you know, you've got things like pyroclastic flows, which can cause yeah. an immediate hazard to a local population. Yeah. But do we also need to understand hazards on a slightly longer term and more global scale? Yes, I think so. I mean, the second part of the lecture actually talked a bit about a little bit about this. We talked about volcanoes and climate. But there are certainly, and again, this is a debate, but there are certainly volcanic eruptive events that have been argued in the literature to cause significant famines. I mean, the Little Ice Ages or the pe or periods within the Little Ice Age are certainly um, part of that. So, you know, there's definitely famines around the time of, of Tambora, for example. Um, and Krakatoa is also thought to, or has not been argued to have induced famine. Um, there's the Justinian plague. There's always there's quite a, I mean there's quite a few papers in in sort of major journals about about whether some of the some kind of major events in prehistory were even induced by large volcanic eruptions. Um, so that is quite important as well because it's not just about average cooling again now. So even in a global warming environment, you're also talking about how volcanoes in, in, interact with weather. So as well as the general cooling trend, do they you know do they induce for example um, the classic example with Tambor is the year without summer. So Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. And the argument is that's because there was no summer because there was a volcanic eruption. It rained and it was horrible for a summer. There was, you know, widespread famine, but she was quite rich. She just sort of sat in a nice house and wrote, and wrote, and wrote Frankenstein. But, but it's significant. You know, these things could have quite, um, potentially could have quite short term, but quite significant impacts on, on populations even now. Fascinating. So I didn't know that about Mary Shelley at all. Yeah. But of course, the, the phrase once in a blue moon, I think, is partly attributed, isn't it, to the to the strange appearance of the moon through yeah. ash, perhaps yeah. perhaps linked to Krakatoa. I can't quite remember. It's kind of entered linguistic yeah. mythology to some extent, hasn't it? It's, it's one explanation for that term. There are several explanations for a term for a blue moon. But yes, that is one. And also you get those, those classic stories. So Edward Munch's The Scream, you know, that the, the screaming figure with the, the, the sky behind, that's also a, a, attributed to volcanic uh, aerosols, giving these these amazing colours. Amazing. So Okay, so volcanoes make an appearance in ash layers to help yeah. us date uh, and, and to understand the past climate and potentially future climates. They appear in popular culture, but they often appear in people's lives that are far more kind of cataclysmic, and that's related to, to volcanic hazards. 
And now, in your lecture last week, you did you talked about a number of different kind of hazards, which seem to kind mm. of almost sit on a bit of a spectrum in terms of the intensity or the effect yeah. that they can have on life. Do you want to just talk us through that again and, and try and draw that out for us a bit more? Well, the idea was, I mean, it's, it's an observation that, that if you, you know, let's pick a volcano. So um, the most common form of, vo of volcanic hazards in, in, in a lot of settings is a lava flow. So, so lots of so volcanoes that are relatively effusive will produce a lot of lava, not very much in the way of explosivity. Um, but even some ex, you know, quite explosive eruptions have a lava phase. Um, and that lava is, is you know, it's, it's highly hazardous if you get really close to it, but it's not very fast moving. Okay. And so it's much easier to manage in a sensible way than things that are fast moving. So if you go, you know, if you go to something like Mount Etna, which is my favorite place, by the way, or one of my favorite places. And um, you, you will see kind of uh, management structures built around areas like Refugio Sapienza to kind of stop lava flows going in certain areas. So unless you kind of are unlucky or just a bit silly, lavas aren't too dangerous. They're really quite dangerous for, for economically, you know, a, a lot of mass lava flow can do a huge amount of damage, but not to life necessarily. Whereas when you start the more fast moving thing, so you think about, you know, um, we talked about Pompeii right at the start, pyroclastic flow deposits or ash water deposits. If it rains, you get a big dump of ash. These fast moving rapid hazards tend to be the most dangerous. And um, if you're very unlucky with very little warning to an eruption, you can't manage your way out of it. Right. So, so for example, we'll go to Naples again and Vesuvius. Um, there is an assumption built in that into the hazard planning around Naples that they would probably get something like two weeks warning and that is based on um historical documentation talking about the last big eruption which talks about two weeks worth of earthquakes and things like that and that's possible but you can also get eruptions from places like vesuvius that are very very rapid so rapid recharge of the magma chamber rapid eruptions if you get 24 hours warning and you've got half a million people within the potential blast zone you can't manage your way out of that no. And so, so these things can become much more dangerous. T t can you can you tell us what are some of the warning signs that people might be looking for? I know that volcanoes can can very subtly change shape, can't they? For example, a, yeah, there's a huge. Well, so the volcanoes that are in, shall we say, the more developed parts of the world, or some volcanoes in the global south that are well monitored, um, especially if there's, if there's kind of aid from the developed world to, to do so, they'll have a whole range of things. So you can be looking at monitoring the gases that come out of them. So for example, you get changes, increases in CO2 if you're recharging a volcano. Um, if you're doing that, you can also deform the shape of the volcano. So somewhere like Mount St. Helens, for example, has got a whole series of GPS monitors on it to look for deformation. Um, you can, so actually there's a really interesting program going on at the moment. The US Geological Survey are monitoring a whole range of volcanoes in, in um, non-developed countries, shall we say, from space to try and look for deformation changes remotely um, because there's so many volcanoes. Um, so there's deformation changes, there's changes to the chemistry, uh, there's earthquakes and, and, and earthquake frequency, even minor earthquakes. So there's a whole range of geophysical ways of monitoring volcanoes. Yeah. Um, and, they, and the aim is, is really, really to give you as much warning as you can um, because there are an awful lot of cities and towns that are close to volcanoes. And then also, you know, we got onto the, another bit of risk, which is lahars. Yeah. So lahars, these mud, mudslides, especially when they're associated with kind of large ice fields. So you know, a lot of volcanoes are very high, very tall, have either permanent or semi-permanent ice there that melts. That ice will follow the river valleys out of the volcano. So you can have a town that's way outside the, the pyroclastic, the likely pyroclastic flow range, mm. but it's got every potential to be taken out by a lahar so the the, the the most depressing example is called the amero tragedy so in the 19 i think it's the 1970s in the amero tragedy but it's a town in south america where the volcano nevada del ruiz um was i mean the, the the local geologists were saying this could erupt yeah you know, and it's got a big glacier on top of it and and the the, the politicians really did not want to be worrying about this they were saying no no you're over you're over worrying about the risk um, and, and i think eventually a, a 
a, a team of geologists were going to come in and sort of to monitor it. And it was too late. And basically, the volcano erupted. It wasn't a very big eruption. Melted part of the glacier. Massive lahar went sh- you know, down the volcano, a long river valley, and just took out a town and killed 25,000 people. Gosh. And that terrible tragedy stimulated a lot of work from people like the USGS to get more and more involved in... in, in um, kind of helping to deal with volcano hazards away from the US. So they've got yeah. quite a big role now in, in other countries. That's that's really fascinating. I, I, mean, I don't think I ever quite knew what a lahar was or even actually how to pronounce it. I think I would have, I think I've been pronouncing it lahar all my life. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, so that is, so that's a mixture of mud and water that has been turned. And ash, and, yeah. And, and ash, and, it, and, it's, it, and it, it's incredibly fast moving, is it? And it moves down river valleys. You, predominantly, yeah. I mean, that's not the so you can get lahars that are not associated necessarily with, um, say, ice. You can get lahars from through um, mudslides in all sorts of ways. But generally speaking, once they start running as a as a mass movement, they they often going to run down river valleys out of a strata volcano. And and help me out here because I genuinely am a novice. What is the difference between that and a pyroclastic flow? So a pyroclastic flow is very different. A pyroclastic flow is hot explosive material that's come out of the volcano. Um, usually, not exclusively, but usually associated with partial or complete collapse of the eruptive column right? or the collapse of a dome. So you'll often get in an eruption um, or during part of the, the eruptive process, you get degassing of the, of the volcano after the main eruptive phase, but you've got this intrusive spine or dome of lava that eventually solidifies and cools. Often it's still quite hot inside, but, but it solidifies as an edifice. And that's inherently unstable. Uh, and, and often that these domes or spines will collapse, sometimes associated with earthquakes, and they will then produce a pyroclastic flow. Okay. So pyroclastic, that pyroclastic material, and it's a mass movement of flow. Thank and they're usually superheated right. and very fast moving. And they, they are often the most lethal of the kind of local hazards. So uh, you know, I've, I've been to Pompeii, for example. So when we yeah. see when we see all of the, the casts of the of those bodies at Pompeii, yeah. I, would, they, would they have been trapped or caught by a pyroclastic flow or was that lava? I ne- never lava. No, the lava was, the, the lava not... was uh, too slow moving. So, um, so there's two kinds of um, hazards associated with, with Pompeii. So there's a pyroclastic flow hazard. Um, Pompeii and Herculaneum, but so the AD 79 eruption of Vesuvius. Mm. Um, and there was the, the pyroclastic flow phase. There was also a fi- a, an ash fallout phase because there's a lot of water involved in that eruption. So um, you have uh, a flow hazard and an ash fall hazard. Okay. Um, and between the pyroclastic flow and the, ash, and the ash fall, that took out Pompeii and Herculaneum. Blimey. So it was, it was, it was taking them out two different ways. So you have a heavy, a heavy ash fall um, at Pompeii, yeah, because um, you had you had kind of a, 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 a part of the eruption come collapse, but not but not in, in a in the same way associated with the pyroclastic flow. Okay, and yeah, you also had a pyroclastic flow phase as well. Blimey. Um, uh, one of the other places that, that I'm really interested in around the world is Montserrat, because yeah. as you as you know, Simon, I've got an interest in British overseas territories. And, yeah. and of course, there was a, a major volcanic eruption on Montserrat a few years ago that has effectively decimated the island. Well, more than decimated. Ha- yeah. Half the island is now effectively uninhabitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be- because there's now a, a vast lava f- lava field covering half the island. So they've had to they've had to move the the capital city and, and various other things. Yeah, that that um, yeah. I mean, the Super Hills are really dangerous, and that that whole area had. Um, I mean, a whole load of terrible things happened to it. It wasn't, I mean, it's had multiple volcanic eruptions, lava fields, and then, of course, it didn't, uh, yeah, it's had, um, didn't have a tsunami as well? And then a hurricane. A hurricane, yeah. I mean, yeah. actually, there was localized tsunamis at one point. But yeah, I mean, it's just not a, it, it's not a pretty island, is it? No, it doesn't seem to be. Just disaster after disaster seems yeah. to hit it. Now, Simon, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I want to move on and talk about. Um, about climate change just a, a little bit more because it, you know, we, we've talked about things like the Little Ice Age and you've got these sudden moments of, of climate change. Um, yeah. w- what about what about longer longer term climate change? What effect do volcanoes have more generally in terms of 
the composition of our atmosphere and the and the longer term prospects for for our climate futures um that's a very interesting one depends what you mean by longer term i suppose so volcanoes well without without volcanoes we wouldn't have an atmosphere that's where they, okay. that's where the, that's where the atmosphere came from in the first place um so that that is a longer term contribution um I mean, geologically speaking, you know, there are periods of time where long periods of active volcanism have had major impact on the climate. So, there's a, you know, there's a classic um, geological studies of like the Deccan traps and, you know, um, so going back into deep geological time. And I think those things are measured on scales that we don't really think about. And, and we are now in a period of, of, of more quiescence in terms of volcanism than, than those geological periods. But I think, you know, if you... One of the big interests um, going forward um, in terms of climate change and volcanoes is what effect. So let's let's say we wind anthropogenic climate change forward and keep going, and we don't we don't get a cap on CO2, and we keep warming and we keep warming. If we do that and we start losing more and more ice, and we start um, destabilizing tectonic regions where you've had ice capping you know ice caps holding down tectonic plates you get tectonic rebound one argument is you'll get an increase in volcanism um now that's interesting because if you're getting an increase in volcanism um that may induce i suppose some volcanic cooling which may balance out the warming but that's only an if and then you've also got the, the issue that if you're melting all that ice you might be low you might do extra loading in, in, in over the sea so you, what does that do in terms of volcanoes that aren't near the ice so there's actually quite a lot of studies at the moment trying to understand this there's quite a few interesting uh, projects working right at the moment trying to understand the the interplay between unloading of, of ice and futures uh, futures for tectonics and eruptions now mostly they're not talking about climate i think most of the studies are interested more in hazards so increased pace of volcanism for example so but, I mean, that, that's fascinating so so the weight of ice at the moment in some regions Mount, mountainous areas, presumably, so, well, not, not, not suppress, areas. suppress, but it, but it suppresses the tectonic action well, at, at continental margins. So, if you've got somewhere, as a classic example, is Iceland, um, or some some of the volcanoes running down South America. If you've got a major weight, I mean, significant weight of ice, depresses the crust. Um, it, it adds extra pressure. I mean, you're thinking about volcanic eruptions, they are basically a release of pressure. The extra pressures, it, is, it has been argued, constrains the rate of volcanic eruption. So, and there's good, there's decently good data to support this, certainly from, from an Icelandic context. You know, there's increased eruptive frequency associated with, with warming, certainly going back the last, you know, 10, 11,000 years. So there is an argument that if you lose a lot more of that ice, you'll get increased volcanism. It's a reminder, isn't it, of the delicacy of the of the whole global system. Uh, the, obviously, the, atmos the atmosphere in a fine balance, but so, but similarly, if ice itself can be a, a suppressant to mm. to volcanic activity, and if, and if that were to disappear, I mean, one wonders about the nature the nature of the future. I mean, it's very hard to predict, presumably, what what could happen under those circumstances. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's all that's true from both a hazard perspective, but also quite a few other perspectives. I mean, I think. If we're thinking about the future of climate change and we're thinking about anthropogenic climate change, um, understandably, most of the work is done and most of the modelling is done over a 100, 200 year time scale, because that's you know what's in most people's imagination. Um, but if you think over longer time scales, you know, the Earth, as you say, the Earth system is very delicate. Mm. And if we get to the point where we pass a lot of tipping points and we can't control things and you start losing massive amounts of ice, um, that's going to have a big influence on volcanism, but it's also, you know, <laughs> that might be the least of our worries, you know, come on. You know, if we, if we lose huge amounts of ice and we, you know, we lose all the permafrost and we get to a point where we can't, you know, where, well, we can't get it back. So we go beyond the natural environmental and climate state we're in now, so yeah. the quaternary, so the ice age cycles, we move into a new geological era. You know, it's, it's only a few million years ago that the world was completely different, you know, yeah. so, cycles of climate change were completely different to that how they are now um and something tipped us out of that and, and, and there are big arguments about exactly what tipped us out of that into yeah. the quaternary so um for example the growth of the himalayas and drawdown of co2 entirely natural process changed the earth fundamentally we are 
it is argued as a species acting like a fundamental geological process and changing the earth. And, and, that, and that's what people refer to as the an- Anthropocene. Am, yes. I, am I right? In, yeah. Yeah, the, the Anthropocene is a big debate in the sense of, of whether it's a geological time period. Um, I think no scientist I know of wouldn't argue that we are now impacting environments and climates so significantly we are acting like an agent of, of you know, of the natural world. We, so there's a guy, um, a friend of mine, uh, Mark Maslin, summed it up as, you know, think of it as we are like an asteroid. You know, we are we are a geological actor. And I think that that's absolutely fair. The debate about the Anthropocene is where you draw the line, where it starts. Uh, and there's a huge debate about that. There is. Yeah. I mean, some some people... Well, so, some people go back almost into kind of pre pre human history, and, and they they because they recognise that humans very early had an impact. Other people look to the nineteen fifties and and nuclear tests and the yeah. the layer the layering of of particular atoms in uh, presumably in in the kind of core samples that you've got, you could you can find evidence of the start of nuclear testing. You can actually you can see that in lots of things. Yeah, I mean you can see it. You can see it, in, if you chose to do it, you can see it in any tree that's old enough. So we call it the bomb spike. So um, the, there are cosmic nuclei like like radiocarbon. People have heard of radiocarbon. But they're created in the upper atmosphere by cosmic ray bombardment. And this, is, this is actually relevant to volcanoes even. Because when I talked about the Little Ice Age, one of the ways we see the solar signal is through these, these cosmic rays that are impacting and generating these new, these new chemical elements in the atmosphere. Nuclear bombs do the same thing. We see this gigantic spike in the 1950s in lots of records. Um, so that's where some people would draw it. Um, I wouldn't. I would draw it in, I would probably draw it about 11 and a half thousand years ago, which is when we invent farming. Because I think everything, it all comes from farming. Yeah. We, yeah I, th- th- that's what I was thinking. When I talked about pre-human history, I was, t- I was thinking that because some people would say things like the industrial revolution or the yeah. agrarian revolution in the 17th or 18th centuries but i i had also heard some people going back as far as that 11 and a half 12,000 years ago yeah i mean for me that's when we do something different so before that period we are uh, intellectually we're the same and in many ways um aspects of our society are the same kind of you know um one of the reasons we are, as a species that evolved in sub-saharan africa can be so successful in a range of environments is technology and we were there in those environments long before farming um you know 30 40 000 years ago but i think when we invent farming we change how we interact with with the world yeah quite significantly and i think for me that's the starting point of the the other thing is actually you know we currently live in what we call an interglacial and we call our interglacial the holocene and there are many 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 interglacials before this one and they all they are all seen to be part of a package of time called the Pleistocene. Our one interglacial gets its own name, and it's it, it, it's, it's us that you know. It seems to me we just re, just rechristen it, call it the Anthropocene, and we can all go home. But you know, anyway, that's a different <laughs> debate. Well, Simon, you have taken us on an extraordinary global tour. We have thought about hazards. We've thought about other insights that volcanoes can offer us into the history of our of our climate, and 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 revealing a, a whole load about. The, the human occupation of the uh, of the world and the way that we've changed the planet. Um, we've talked about the role of uh, in climate change. We've talked about different kind of hazards. If this has been the most extraordinary question and answer. Thank you so much for for giving your time. Um, I know that you'll be happy to answer other people's questions if they were to come in over the next weeks and months via this chat. And we'll we might even do you know an update Q and A if if we we gather questions uh, over time. But Simon, for now, thank you very much. It's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, what I'm going to do is also I'm going to look forward slightly um, and just tell our, our audience at home about what we've got coming up. So there is Simon's lecture that we've had last week and tonight on understanding volcanic hazards. Um, then we've got uh, in, uh, sorry, starting on uh, on the 1st of February, we've got Contemporary Urban Environments with Mike Dalton. So on the 1st of February, we'll have Mike's lecture and then the week after, we will have the, the Q&A. And then on the 22nd of February, we've got a carbon cycle and we're going to be talking about wildfires with Daniele uh, Colombaroli. And then finally, modern uh, modern slavery. And that's with Professor Catherine Brickell, who's going to be reflecting on some of her amazing work uh, on a project called Blood Bricks, which is telling unstil- uh, untold stories of modern slavery and climate change from 
uh, Cambodia. And just to say, as a, as a final reminder, we are putting all of these videos on, uh, on our new teacher hub and you can also find them on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. So all of these videos will be there uh, along with a whole host of teaching resources that we're going to be putting on in the next few weeks and months. So we hope that's going to be helpful uh, to you, uh, pupils who might be studying for GCSEs or A-levels and hopeful and helpful also to you teachers uh, who are teaching some complex issues to people who need, because they're often learning from home, access to lots of resources. So we hope this is helpful to you. Um, if you'd like to see us do anything else or have suggestions about topics, let us know. Uh, you can leave a comment here or, or get in contact with us at the Department of Geography. We'd love to hear from you and, and make sure that we're supplying you with the kind of stuff that's genuinely helpful for your classroom teaching. But for now, from Simon and from me, uh, good evening and thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Keep an eye out for the, um, the volcanic hazards uh, mapping thing we can try and put together on Teacher Hub. That should come out very soon. Yeah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. And that will be a great resource. Thank, thanks for putting that together, Simon. No worries. Right, see you soon, everybody. Take care of yourselves. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.